Good afternoon, everybody. And thanks for coming to join this session uh, today. I hope you've had some great sessions so far. It was really nice just to talk to some of you uh, who've come to join the session and hear what you're hoping to get out of it. And I want to say at this point, it's such a big topic. I know we all know that. I'm going to offer up some personal experiences and I'm going to offer up some hopefully practical things that I've seen or experienced that have helped, as well as those from an awareness point of view that have not. And I hope in some way that gives you all something to take away. I suspect there will be time for questions. I've got a fancy iPad here that I didn't know I was going to have from the organizers. So if you apparently send your questions over, then they'll land here and we should have time for them. And I want to warn you now, there will be uh, some participation, but I promise you it's it's as much as raising hands or lowering hands. So when I get to the point of asking you to potentially raise your hand, please don't be terrified that I'm suddenly going to, to then call on you to do more. It's just from an awareness and interest point of view. But let's jump in. I'd like to start actually with a personal story. When I started my career, and I won't go into any more detail than this, I researched the company that I joined carefully. I had only recently come out as a gay man and I was still kind of going through the adjustments, I guess I probably still am, of that experience. But finding a company that would be a place that I could really belong was first and foremost for me. It was really important. And I went somewhere that was award-winning. They were an employer of choice for LGBTQ+. They were in the Times and other papers for being the best place to work for LGBTQ+, people. I was really excited. But my lived experience outside the walls of that LGBTQ plus network was different. And it ranged from listening to little microaggressions or things that potentially were said subconsciously all the way through to kind of quite open, supposedly jokey homophobic language. In the most extreme case, I ended up repositing myself, lying about my sexuality in the workplace because I felt so uncomfortable. And the more the company published their stats on diversity in the LGBTQ plus area, the more galling it was to see this difference between this public, these public stats, which I'm sure were true, but the actual experience day to day. And so I think in some ways, it's tricky to share this, right? Maybe it's controversial, but I think it's important to speak about it. And I feel it illustrates at a very simple level, what we mean when we say the difference between diver diversity on the one hand and then inclusion and belonging on the other hand, because that's what was lacking for me. Fast forward to Tuesday this week, let's maybe go a bit more positive. At my current employer, we ran as part of Pride Month a discussion panel and I was asked to moderate the panel. Six panelists were volunteers, representatives of the LGBTQ plus community at our company. And we had nearly 200 employees opt to attend from across the business, which was really humbling. It was a very special moment and it made me think how much things were different or had changed in that time. But what really made a difference actually was the messages and the questions that came from allies from the community afterwards. They said they'd learned so much, which was interesting because sometimes as a member of this community, we talk about the same things and we wonder, is this resonating? Are people learning? Is it making any difference? And I was told that it had. Specifically, people felt more empowered to actually step in and make some mistakes if it meant that they could better support proactively the LGBTQ plus community as allies. That was my lived experience this week. I felt like I belonged. I felt included. And so there is a difference. We don't have any awards, by the way, for LGBTQ plus. We don't have an employer of choice. We don't have a time's best place to work for the LGBTQ plus community. But the lived experience said differently. So perhaps now is the time to introduce myself. My name is Toby Huff, and I am the Director of People and Culture for Europe for HiBob. I won't go on too much about HiBob, but I can see some of my team members here and I must, otherwise I'll be in trouble. Uh, but Bob is a modern HR platform. 
Uh, it's built for growing modern multinational businesses like yours. It was designed with the needs of HR in mind. So for leadership teams, it gives that kind of greater oversight and visibility of the business. For managers, it's access to insights and resources for how they can lead more effectively. For employees, it's the tools and information that they need to connect to develop and to grow. And we're going to come back to that in some of the practical components in a little bit. Our global team serves over 2,400 customers across more than 100 countries and over 100,000 employees worldwide. So I have the role of working in HR for an HR business, which is great, but also demanding because the team challenges us regularly. They are all informed, they have high expectations, they're aware of great HR practices. And that is also true of great HR practices when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. I wanna pause on the talk for a second and I'd love for you just to take a moment to reflect. Can you think of a time when you felt personally excluded? It can be from any stage in your life, whether it be many years back, I hope it was, or whether it be more recent. And this is one of those moments where I would like you to raise a hand if something came to mind. I'm not gonna call on you. But I'd love to know if something came to mind where you felt personally excluded at some point, raise your hand for me. Hank. I'm delighted to see some hands not up, by the way. We need more of that. Keep your hands up, please. And lower your hand if that experience was not in the workplace. So if it happened in a workplace, keep your hand up for me. Okay. Thank you. You can lower your hands. So that, I was pretty confident coming into this that this would happen, right? Hands are up for both. I'm afraid too many hands were up for experiences in the workplace. We still have work to do. We all know this feeling, whether it be from many years ago or right now. Sometimes when we talk about DEIMB, diversity, equity, inclusion, I think it can lose the human impact piece but we do actually all know this feeling. We hope we left it behind in the playground. We hope we educate our young that it can be and should be left behind then. But judging by the hands that were up, it's still coming with us into the workplace. And that is especially true for companies that are global, that have a diverse workforce. Let's define a little bit what we mean though. We throw these terms around, like we've made some personal connection now. On a simple level, diversity refers to the characteristics that make you and your people unique. Inclusion, this is the behavior and the norms that help people feel welcome. And belonging refers to an individual's actual sense of acceptance. They may feel like subtle differences, but they really matter. Simply having a diverse workforce shouldn't be the goal because ultimately, if your employees don't feel included or like they belong in your culture, they will not offer up their full potential. That's the, 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 the least of your worries. They won't stay and they shouldn't stay because they deserve better. They'll find a company where they do. This is what I did. I'm speaking from experience. And let's be clear. This isn't a small or a simple topic, and it was really great speaking to some of you beforehand about your reasons for, for wanting to be here for this talk now. This is complex, it's messy, and it's evolving and changing all the time. I don't stand here pretending to be an authority in this. I don't know who is. And I'd love afterwards to hear some of your experiences because I think it's through this conversation that we actually learn and push forward. What we're seeing here is just a small subset. I'm sure there are more. But for each of these groups, acts of exclusion, exclusion, take place frequently. Sadly, at one end of the scale, these acts can be deliberate still. Nearly 20% of LGBTQ plus employees report being discriminated against. This is particularly egregious for non-binary or trans individuals. But many of us, and I'm sure this includes you, many of us sat here today we hold dear actually to ourselves the values of inclusivity. 
We don't want to be behaving like this, but we're influenced by our subconscious very often. Many of you, unconscious bias training is becoming more and more and more frequent. Raise your hand for me if you've had some unconscious bias training or experienced some of it. Yeah. This is what we're trying to tackle with the UV training. We're trying to tackle the fact that many of us have egalitarian values where we want to welcome people in. So we want to eliminate those practices that are accidentally excluding people. And they can be so simple. Every time I'm asked about my wife or girlfriend, I have to come out again rather than a partner. The impact of a Hindu employee where there's no celebration around Diwali at a business. A wheelchair bound employee that doesn't have the right heights, water taps in the office for them. A non-binary employee without a they or them option in the HR system when they join the business. Communication channels that are optimized for neurotypical employees. It's actually estimated that 15 to 20% 20, 20 of the population is neurodivergent. About one in 45 people is somewhere on the autism spectrum, but I don't think that our communication channels and practices are anywhere near reflecting that yet. So on paper, you might have a wonderfully diverse workforce, but sadly, every day, little things can happen that can create a barrier of exclusion for those individuals. You should celebrate the diverse workforce, do not get me wrong, but your work doesn't stop there. And this is where I'd love to go into more detail in today's discussion. I guess let's pretend there are some cynics in the audience. Let's pretend there are people thinking, okay, great, but actually we're functioning really well. Like why does, this act why does it actually matter? There's a reason on there that I, I personally feel is the most important reason, which it is because it is the right thing to do. Uh, it comes back to the fact that many of us really hold these egalitarian values. We want people to be treated fairly we want them to feel included, and this should be enough. But in case we have some cynics, let's give some other reasons. Let's go deeper into this. The first one, with talent growth and development within your business, if people truly belong, they are more likely to stay with you. They're more likely to take risks, offer up ideas, step out with that innovative piece of innovation that they've been hiding. They're more likely to grow their career with you. The great resignation will have been talked about by somebody else and I'm not going to do it now, but anything we can do to combat that is a good thing. It also positively impacts performance. So I'd love to tell you there was a body of research that was done about how diversity and specifically surface level diversity, this is observable diversity, so things like gender, racial differences, how do they impact team performance? Well, the research that I'm referencing here showed that those diverse teams outperformed. They are smarter as a group and they were more innovative. So what the researchers did is they got them to undertake a set of tasks where there was an objectively known best outcome, required brainstorming, solving puzzles, negotiating, detecting patterns. And they looked to see how the groups performed. The fact that the diverse groups ex excelled in this versus the, the more homogenous groups led to the, a bunch of questions around it. Like, how is this actually happening? So they videoed the groups and they coded a bunch of stuff, things like the number of unique words spoken by each person, uh, the unique bits of information shared, discussing topic, how long were they discussing topics for? They found that diverse groups discuss, discuss topics for longer. They found that, uh, that they took longer to get to the answer. What they saw with the homogenous groups is they tended to overemphasize the shared views and practices and information that they had in common. What we saw in the diverse groups were individuals more deeply considering other people's arguments. And because they knew that they were going to expect it, they better prepared their own points of view. They expected to encounter different views. We also saw it with mixed age groups in the study was shown to increase productivity amongst both older and younger employees. There were different perspectives being shared, different experiences, different social networks. It was a sort of synergistic a uh, combination of resources. So it seems like surface level diversity is a cue, but that's all it is because what's happening in these groups then is a reminder that they all do come from different backgrounds with different experiences and different perspectives. And that's changing people's behavior. I thought that was so interesting. Having a truly included workforce will help with customer centricity. Our customers, whether they be B2B or B2C are diverse. And so we need to come up with solutions that work for them. 
There are some horror stories that you will know. I can think of three that come to mind. When the Apple Health app launched, there was nothing in there about the female period. They said it covered everything to do with health. When the icon for a CTO, a chief technology officer, made its way into the icons in, in an iPhone, it was a blonde haired male. When YouTube launched, 10% of videos appeared upside down. About 10% of the population are left handed. There were ingrained issues within the product itself. And what we're seeing is with these diverse groups, those discussions that we referenced before, try and help avoid those pitfalls. And finally, from a McKinsey study, diversity, when there is equity, inclusion, belonging, it helps impact profitability. Companies with ethnically diverse execs are 33% more likely to have an above average profitability than their more homogenous peers. And gender diversity is similarly related to a 20% increase in the likelihood that a company will be more profitable. So what can we do about it? I feel like, you know, we've talked about the fact that it exists. We've seen amongst all of us today that challenges of inclusion and belonging exist still today in the workplace. I hope we all feel it's the right thing to do to combat it, but in case we needed convincing, we've seen some data points that suggest that for business performance, it's also the right thing to do. And this is where I'm going to share perspectives now. I'm convinced you will have ideas of your own. But I think it starts with awareness. In my own personal experience, I believe that's where it begins, at both a macro and a micro level. So for individual employees, when they start to hear about events through the year that they might have been completely unaware of in their world, it helps them stop and slow down and think. It can seem tokenistic in the HR world. We've got to make sure we, we, we as a company are supporting this religious event, this diversity month, International Women's Day, etc. But it's not tokenistic because every time you do it, you are positively reinforcing to those individuals from those groups that they have a place in your business. And crucially for the allies, you're helping them better understand how to be better allies. And I refer back to some of the feedback that we got from our pride discussion panel this week. It was from that ally group. They were saying, I now feel better equipped to have conversations about this. I, have, I feel better equipped to speak to our non-binary uh, employee who I'd previously been a little bit tentative about saying the wrong thing. We, on the panel, by the way, we had a couple of the panelists say the wrong thing, for its unquote, use the wrong pronoun. We, we, we made, a, it wasn't planned, but it was beautiful. Because that was one of the takeaways we wanted them to, to, to realize that don't say nothing, say something. And if you get it wrong, we'll assume positive intent and we'll, we'll chip away at it together. The other thing at an individual level we can do is educate on it on unconscious bias. And there is research around that that proves that it helps us slow down and scrutinize our behaviors and get out of that system one thinking where we're auto responding in so many things, not because we're bad people, but because we are in a challenging world that requires us to make these snappy decisions. On a bigger level, awareness is great through data. And this is where having the right HR software will really help. Collecting data at all levels to understand what's going on. In Unconscious Bias, we talk about the meritocracy paradox, saying, oh, we're fine, we're a meritocracy. We make decisions based on merit. We don't have issues of, of exclusivity or a lack of belonging here. That is proven to show that they are more likely to make decisions based on, on gut feel that is influenced by unconscious bias. Whereas if you slow down your behaviors, you look at the data from what are all of the stats from this merit cycle? Who received an increase? Who received an increase last time? What were the stats from the promotion round? Who are we promoting? Are they the people that are shouting the loudest and that look like us? Or are they people that really deserve it? Are we going into the shadows with our torches and finding our whole business and bringing them with us? Also true with things like recognition and rewards. When we move away from discretionary based bonuses to bonuses that are built on data-driven decisions, take the humans out of it ideally, again, we're seeing a more equitable distribution of the bonus pot across workforces. It doesn't stop at awareness though. It comes down to integrating these ideas. And one of my own, I guess, personal learnings from working in HR, from being part of a, 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 of a, of a group uh, as a gay man is that there isn't one answer. There isn't a secret. 
and it's granular. We have to chip away at this and try different things. And actually very often the grandstanding and the talks like this, they're good, but it's the very specific decisions and things that we make day to day that actually make the difference. Culture committees and employee resource groups, they're not new, but they still really have an important place. If you've got them set up well, your employees will have their voice from diverse backgrounds influencing things like your code of conduct, influencing the holidays, the religious festivals that you choose to celebrate, rather than a stretched HR team that has great intentions but can't look round every single corner on their own. You also give a legitimate platform through ERGs to these groups with budget, with exec sponsors. You are telling them they have a place. You are giving them company resources to share their stories and engage in conversation. It's really powerful, even though it's not new. The second thing I'd point out is recognition program. We mentioned it before, so I'm not going to go over, but with your recognition programs, really try and avoid ad hoc and discretionary wherever you can, because that's where we are most likely to make those decisions that are informed by unconscious bias and miss those deserving people that we might not have thought of immediately when it came about. Use the metrics and the data to see who you rewarded and awarded last time and make sure that there isn't an accidental pattern in there. Something I love that comes out of unconscious bias training is that empowerment that you're not a bad person from this, we all have it. It's what is there. So let's slow down, scrutinize and avoid those kind of ad hoc. Lean into the feedback. So at HiBob, we run quarterly surveys. I know some businesses, depending on their op operating rhythm, will run them more frequently. Our platform, where we send them from, is very adaptable. And we have a specific set of questions that ask individuals about their inclusion and their belonging. We ask them to tell us how we're doing on three areas. All bobbers, regardless of their differences, are treated fairly. We're asking them to think about their personal and their witnessed experiences. I can be my authentic self at work. And I feel like I really belong at Highball. These are the things that we ask people in our surveys. Tech in general can be great if it's used well. It can help employees express themselves in different ways, find mutual interests around the world, not just share HR data that we need, but actually information about themselves. We're seeing in Bob that where companies don't publicly require, these are our clients, when they don't publicly require people to put down things like their gender, um, on the public facing page, but instead are able to share other information of their choosing, their hobbies, their skills, uh, things that make them unique. We're seeing that is increasing in visibility and the typical stats like gender, they're decreasing in visibility in terms of what people are choosing to share about themselves. I'm gonna come back to that in a minute as well, because I think there's such a small example there that's super powerful. Flexible policies to promote diversity. I think many of you will be aware of these, but you know, are you scrutinizing your need to send people traveling around the world when they've got children to look after? At a previous company, we had an international onboarding. And I remember, I think about this, I was in my early 20s. I thought it was amazing. California for a month, count me in. And then I realized many months later that for a new employee with a one-year-old, that had put them under serious stress before they joined. They didn't know how to raise it. They didn't know who to bring it up with. Blind spots. But thinking about these, these alternatives, working hours we know about make a difference, giving people the flexibility, encouraging people through leadership practices to block time in their diary, role modeling, when they've got kids time, when they've got gym time, when they've got something that matters to them. I use with my team non-negotiables. Everyone has to have one. What are your non-negotiables? Well, then I can look at them in the eye and say, hey, it's Tuesday evening. It's a non-negotiable. Go, go do your thing. This can wait. This can wait until tomorrow. Work from locations, no meeting days, etc. So the flexibility around how we project and identify ourselves, I want to share something here. The information I shared earlier around people are actually opting not to go for traditional labels, but rather share information about themselves that they think makes them feel more unique. We're seeing this increase. But also, sometimes in HR, we need to capture a legal gender. It's a requirement, right? Or the payroll processes that we interface with require it. Reporting requires it. But if you have a system like ours, you can have multiple fields. That can be a background field that isn't publicly display displayed. And instead we can have identifiable gender, preferences. What do people want to be known as? It's a small thing, but with that flexibility, you can cater for both. 
And I think we've seen that really go down well with uh, employees. So many of these are granular and they're practical. And in my experience, this is where the difference happens though. It, the grand gestures are important, but actually what we do on the day to day makes a difference. I mentioned about the uh, gender fields. Uh, at HiBob, when you join, you log into the, at our company, you log into the platform a week before you join as a pre-boarder and you set your profile up and you fill out a lot of this stuff that makes you unique. And we also have identifiable gender with they and we have they them pronouns. Less than 1% of our company uses this. But on our panel this week, one of our colleagues used this. And they explained how, before they joined, this was a point of anxiety for them. How am I going to explain to people that I'm non-binary? How, how many times am I going to have to educate and correct people? And look, we're not perfect. It does still happen. But the fact that their first formal technical interaction with the business was a drop down that had a they, them in identifiable gender and pronouns, they'd been with us for nearly a year now and they still remember it. They felt included before they started. And I feel like that's such an important example of what we mean by the middle and the granular. I'm nearly done. But this isn't nearly done. And I think that's another important takeaway for us in this session now. New generations will come through with new preferences for different ways of working. Fresh research will uncover greater understanding of neurodiversity. As the retirement age increases, the age mix in our workforce will expand. We are still learning about gender identity and sexuality. We are still learning about the historical impact of past racism and the current impact of current racism. We are learning which means that our approaches and our practices need to constantly be scrutinized, checked, changed. It will go on and it will continue to do it. And we should enjoy it. I think the creativity and the conversations that we have in order to try these things are some of the high points career-wise of what I do each day. So finally, this week at our Pride panel, which really I felt embraced this idea of, inclus of an inclusive workplace, we had at the end of it, these people that, that came back afterwards from the allied community and said, I now feel empowered to better support you all. I understand that I can get it wrong. I understand some practical tips of how I can help. And most importantly, I'm looking forward to carrying on the dialogue. And that bit made me really smile because that's what we need to do. Thank you very much for your listening.